We have been in this series of messages called From the Hard to the Good, how God takes the hard and the difficult stuff in our life, and the reality is, is that there's nothing in your life that's wasted. There's not one crisis that you go through. There's not one trial. There's not one deadly circumstance that we end up facing. That God can't take that and use it and mold us and shape us for his good. Sometimes it takes more time than we would like for those things to be worked out. And this morning we're going to be dealing with one of what I think is one of the most critical areas of our life that we struggle with. And it's oftentimes reflected in the questions that we ask. And I I would say something to you this morning that you probably may not have heard from anybody. And it's this simple truth that on the road from where you are right now to becoming the person that God wants you to be and, and needs you to be, there are going to be multiple opportunities for you to face the pressure of other people who want you to do what they think is the best thing in the world for you. And at the same time, you're going to end up disappointing them because you've made a decision that the most important thing in your life is hearing the voice of God and being obedient to him. And all along the way, we're going to leave behind us the disappointments of other people, their expectations, their manipulations, as they try to get you to follow a path other than what God wants you to follow. Now, you may be sitting here and you may be wrestling with some dilemmas in your own life right now about, God, what do you want me to do in the future? What job am I supposed to take? Who am I supposed to marry? Who am I supposed to date? Uh, Am I supposed to change jobs? Am I supposed to make a move? And it's often in those situations, in those circumstances that as a pastor, and Pastor Danny would testify to this as well, it's probably the most common question that we are asked in the ministry, and it's simply this, what is the right thing for me to do? If you have never asked somebody that question, you're probably lying. Because the reality is, is that every single one of us ask that question from time to time. We want to know what is the right thing for me to do in this situation and these circumstances. And the truth is, is that there will never cease to be a supply of people who seem to know what is better for your life than you do. And they will not be afraid of voicing their opinion to you. They will not be afraid of proof texting certain scripture in the Bible to show you this is why you need to do this and not this. And there have been many times throughout the course of my adulthood where I've been faced with decisions where I really wasn't sure what the right thing for me to do was. And I wish I could say that I've always listened to the voice of God because I haven't. I I wish I could say that I always chose to do the right thing because I didn't. And the reality was is that I ended up living with the consequences of making poor decisions and letting other people's opinions and and playing for their approval to matter more to me in those moments than the approval of the one who ultimately counts, and that's God himself. And most of the time, we, we spend the majority of our energy and our efforts and our worries playing to the wrong crowd. We play to the audience of people who we think opinions ultimately matter when the reality is, is when it comes to your life and when it comes to your God-given purposes, there's nobody whose opinion matters more in this world than God's opinion. And if we're going to make good and godly decisions, we need to understand what the right thing for us to do is. Not just right now, but every time that we face one of those situations and one of those circumstances where we're wrestling with, do I turn left or do I turn right? Do I go here or do I go there? Do I not do this or do I do this? And the only way that you are ever going to make those kind of decisions consistently is that you have to predecide 
that you are going to be obedient to the voice of God and his call on your life no matter what. You're going to have to pre-decide, I'm going to do what God wants rather than doing what my flesh wants or what other people's opinion is. I'm going to pre-decide that when it comes to choosing the right thing to do, I'm going to do what God wants and I'm going to do it every time, no matter what. And, and here's a secret. If, when you make that decision, all the forces of hell will come against you. When you make that decision that I'm going to do what God wants me to do, no matter what, all of hell will be unleashed against you. Because that is where the rubber meets the road. Every single time, consistently. And this is oftentimes the place where we are tempted to make some, what I would say, poor decisions based on the information that we have. And one of the challenges to doing this consistently in our life is the temptation to compromise. When God tells us something, how many of you have ever felt like you've heard a word from God? I, I would say most of us, if you're followers of Jesus Christ and you're here today, there have been times in your life when you've been praying about something, you've been wrestling with a decision, and you think you heard clearly from God, here's what I want you to do. And yet at the same time, your flesh was wrestling with it. You were going, ah, I'm not sure I want to do that. And the reason why, it wasn't just that maybe you couldn't see the payoff, but you knew that decision you were getting ready to make was going to disappoint people. There were going to be people who would not approve. There would be people who would put the pressure on you. And, and the reality is, is that temptation to please people starts really early, from the time we're children. But here, here's the part we, we don't understand, is that that temptation to be a people pleaser never goes away. It stays with us. It shadows us for the rest of our life. And until we get a grip on this about whose opinion matters the most in our life and who are we ultimately going to try to please, whether it's going to be God or whether it's going to be your parents or whether it's going to be others or your spouse or your kids, because they all have opinions and they, they aren't shy about sharing them with you. And uh, there have been multitudes of times where I knew God was speaking, and yet at the very same time, I was tempted to compromise because I thought I could just do some of what God wanted me to do, but not all of it, in order to keep the peace and maintain relationships. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that move you didn't make that you look back on and you're going, man, I missed the opportunity. That person that you felt like you were supposed to be dating and yet you, you never had the courage to ask them. Or, or that person that you uh, knew you weren't supposed to be with, hanging out with, and yet you did. And you look back and you're going, man, how would my life be different today? if I had not compromised. Those who try this end up discovering that God is not into negotiations. And, and when you let the fear of other people's approval mess with you, you, you're getting ready to head down a road of regrets. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 25. In the NIV, it says this, the fear of man will prove to be a snare. That means that when you let other people's opinion of you, their approval, be the thing that drives you, you're setting yourself up for a trap where the devil will work. Why? Because the devil loves compromise. Why? Because he, he will give us part of the truth, but not all the truth. And, and with the truth, he'll slide in a lie to say that if you just do this, then God will be happy and, and everybody will be pleased. Have you ever found out that compromise never delivers what it promises? Anybody ever made a compromise and been disappointed? I love the way the message translation puts this. The fear 
of human opinion disables. Trusting in God protects you from that. What? A lifetime of regrets. Here's the second challenge we face from moving from the hard to the good. And and that is pressure from people. Anybody ever experienced pressure from other people to do something or not to do something? Every single one of us do. And, And it's not just something that happens every now and then. It's something that happens all the time. Can I tell you something that the pressure that you feel being exerted on you from others is not coming from other people. Your pressure to please them is something that happens on the inside. It's internal. So we don't have a people problem. What we have is a problem with ourselves. And that problem with ourselves is that we think that we can have it our way and yet still be pleasing to God at the very same time, most of the time it does not work out that way. The pressure for decision-making is mostly entirely in your mind. Here's a hard truth. The opposite of the sacrificial call of the gospel, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your number one duty, your number one goal in life should be to please him. The opposite of that sacrificial call of the gospel on our life is self-preservation. The reason we cave to other people's expectations and other people's opinions is because we're trying to keep ourselves safe. We're trying to do something that pleases everybody without causing us to disappoint anybody else. Hmm, everybody's quiet. Wow. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul discovered. The Apostle Paul discovered that when you live your life trying to please other people, you'll end up playing to the wrong crowd for the, le- for, for the majority of your life, and you'll end up living with those consequences. When you try to make decisions based on what is best for you in the moment without consulting God and bringing him into that conversation, you set yourself up for a lifetime of disappointments and you live with the consequences of those. In Galatians chapter one, verse 10, listen to what Paul says. He says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be God's servant. I like the way the apostle James put this. When we're wrestling with those dilemmas where we're going, "Ah, you know, what's the right thing for me to do? And, And honestly, most of us already know what the right thing is to do. We just don't have the courage to do it. So when we're asking somebody else, oh, what's the right thing for me to do in this situation, this circumstance? The reality is the Holy Spirit, the word of God has already revealed to you the right thing to do. And you just don't have the guts to do it because you don't want to deal with the disappointment and the fallout that comes from the people around you. And so James put it this way. James chapter one, verses seven and eight. He says, such doubters... And that's what we are doing when we know we've heard from God on something and then we're we're looking for an easier way (laughs) to do it than the painful way of what obedience oftentimes costs us. James said this, such doubters are thinking two different things at the same time and they cannot decide about anything they do. They should not think they will receive anything from God. Here's a secret. Doing what God wants and what God asks. And, and over the course of my Christian journey, I have, God's asked some big things. Every time it is hard, super hard on the front end. But on the back end, 
It always costs me way less to be obedient from the get-go than it does to make a wrong decision in the beginning and then try to turn the boat around. If there's anything I can tell you this morning about how to get from the hard to the good, no matter what the dilemma is, no matter what the decision is that you are wrestling with today, is simply this, you need to learn to listen to the voice of God and respond to it immediately. Don't put it off until later. Don't wait to see what somebody else thinks. But if God has spoken to you clearly, then our responsibility is to learn to recognize his voice from all the other voices in our life that are screaming for our attention, that are voicing their opinions, and respond to him as quickly as possible. If there was anyone who ever did this well in the New Testament, it would have been Mary. And you're going, Mary, oh, that is Jesus' mom. No, not Jesus' mom. I'm talking about Mary, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. If there was anybody who learned to listen to the voice of Jesus and to respond to him, it was Mary. Because every time you read scripture and, and Jesus is in town, Mary is sitting at his feet. Or, or she is waiting on him. And in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, if you've got your Bibles, flip over there for just a second. We're, we're going to see that Mary shows us how to make good and godly decisions, even when we're facing pressure from other people's opinions to do something different than what God is telling us. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, Jesus is in Bethany, and, and this is two to six days right before Passover, right before Jesus goes to the cross. The Gospel of Mark and Matthew puts this two days, and the Gospel of John puts this as happening four to, uh, six days prior to that. I think John's timeline is a little better, so we're going to read a little from both uh, occasions. Mary obviously feels like God has spoken to her, and what God is asking her to do is super hard. Why? Because it's going to cost her financially. It, it's, it's a big ask. And not only is it going to cost her financially, it's going to cost her relationally. It's going to cost her something, and it's going to, it's going to be a little embarrassing. Sometimes what God asks us to do is difficult because he's asking us to risk something that we want to try to protect from harm, and that is ourself and how other people view us. And so God speaks a word to Mary and says, I want you to do this. I want you to prepare for it. Why? Because it, it's going to matter later. What you do now has consequences that carry on throughout the course time of your life. So follow along with me as we read in the gospel of Mark chapter 14. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. In the Gospel of John, it said she didn't just stop by pouring it on his head. She poured it on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, what God was asking Mary to do cost her financially because nard was so rare and so expensive that people actually used it as investments. And they would set it aside. And, and it was reserved for ultra special occasions like the anointing of the king. Or it was used for someone's burial. So it was costly and it was rare. And God was asking her, I want you to go buy this. And when you buy it, I want you to take the first opportunity that you have when Jesus is around. And I want you to anoint his head and anoint his feet and dry it with your hair. And the first opportunity she has is a dinner party given in honor of Jesus. Can you imagine 
knowing that's the thing that God's asking you to do, and yet knowing that everybody sitting at the table isn't going to understand what you're doing. Anybody ever crash a party? She's hosting the party, and she's getting ready to crash it by doing something that is so outside the norm that it's going to disappoint people. They're going to criticize her. And this is exactly what happens because when she breaks the seal on that jar, the house is immediately filled with the smell of perfume and everybody recognizes what that scent is. Why? Because if you've ever smelled it once in a lifetime, you will never forget it. And then Mary does something so unusual. She lets her hair down. Women in Jewish culture did not ever let their hair down in a public setting except when they were in private with their husband. So that is intimate, intimate stuff. And she's kneeling at his feet and she's anointing his feet and she's wiping it with her hair. Have you ever embarrassed your parents? Have you ever embarrassed your kids? All the time, if you've got kids, you're gonna embarrass them. Anybody ever embarrass your family? Hmm, yeah. So look at what it says in verses four and five. It says, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? Can I tell you something? If you choose to please God above the opinions of other people, you're gonna make decisions that will go against what they think is best for your life. And, And when you tell them, Here's what I feel like God wants me to do. No, he doesn't want me to enter that career, but he wants me to give myself away by doing this for a living. And they're going, you can't make any money at doing that. You're so smart. You got talent. You should be doing this or that. And they'll go, what a waste. What a waste. And a lot of times by exerting that kind of pressure on you, it will cause you to second guess what you thought you heard from God. So here Mary is at Jesus's feet and everybody in the room is, except for Jesus, is going, what a waste. We could have taken that perfume and sold it and fed the poor and the hungry in our community for a year. But you know what? Mary wasn't thinking about that. Mary wasn't thinking about lost opportunities and what she could have done with what she had. She was thinking about what did God tell me to do and this is my opportunity to do it and if I let it slip by, I'm going to miss it. Can I tell you something else? People who want to give you advice, they they don't always have your best interest in mind. People who you oftentimes ask, what's the right thing for me to do? They don't have your best interest in mind. There's nobody who has more interest in your future and good intentions for you than God does. Nobody. Nobody cares more about you than God does. Look at what John says. He said, here's why that conversation started. One of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. He he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in. Then Jesus speaks up. And when Jesus speaks, everybody else shuts up in the room. He says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. You hear what Jesus is saying? He says, you you are always going to have an opportunity to do something for somebody else, but you won't always have the opportunity to do something for me when I ask you to. This is probably one of the most important lessons I could teach you today about moving from the hard to the good, that when God tells you something, sometimes it comes with a time factor 
That means that if we don't respond in obedience then, we miss the opportunity and it's not going to come back around. If Mary had waited to do what she felt like God was asking her to do, she would have missed anointing Jesus before he went to the cross. She would have missed her opportunity and it would have never come back around again. So we need to learn to make the most of our opportunities now. The times where I felt like God was speaking to me in my life were times where I was at a crossroads. I was a teacher and a coach and I felt like God was calling me into ministry and I talked to other people and they were like, eh, you know, man, you, you got a good thing going here. And, and I was getting ready to leave that and, and take a cut financially. But I also knew this is what God wanted me to do. So I left teaching and coaching and went into full-time ministry. There were times where I made job changes, not because I needed to, but because I felt like God was calling me to. There were times where I, I left good situations to go to bad situations simply because I knew God was speaking and people were asking, what are you thinking? Why are you doing that? I knew that if I didn't take that opportunity then, the comfort of being where I was would keep me in a place God didn't want me to be. Sometimes we get so comfortable with our situation and our circumstances. Maybe we're at a place financially where we don't need to make a move and maybe we're where we've always wanted to be. And yet at the same time, we know something's missing, God's speaking, and, and if we're not obedient then, we'll never be obedient. See, the toughest part of pre-deciding to be obedient to God and please him ahead of time is that you must be willing to die to yourself. You must be willing to die to yourself. And then Jesus explains it to his disciples. She did what she could. Mark 14, eight and nine. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she did uh, will also be told in memory of her. Some of you right now are wrestling with family decisions that are not just gonna impact you, it's gonna impact the people around you. Some of you are wrestling with career decisions. Do I take this career path or that career path? Do I stay at this school? Do I make a change? And, and you're still asking that question, how do I know if God is speaking to me? Anybody ever ask that question? How do I know God is speaking to me? Here's two questions you need to ask yourself. Number one, is it self-serving? So many times we do things in the flesh and we blame God for it. Oh, I thought God was telling me. But yet at the same time, we're doing it because there, there's something that pays off. The people's approval, expectations, the plot of the crowd. And so we do things not necessarily because our motive is right. We do it because it serves our self, our agenda. Here's the second question you need to ask. Does it contradict scripture? Does what I feel like God is telling me to do, is any part of it in conflict with what God has already revealed in his word? God will never tell you to do something that will go against what he's already revealed in his word. So if you're in doubt, if it's God speaking, is it self-serving? Does any part of what I feel like God is asking contradict scripture? If it does, it's probably not God. So how do you know if God's doing the asking? Here's two signs that you can kind of take to the bank is number one, he will ask you to do things that you would have never come up with on your own. Why? Because our God is creative. He knows you inside and out. He knows 
every aspect of your life. He knows your hopes, your dreams, your desires. And when he asks you something, a lot of times it's going to be so outside of the ordinary and outside of your comfort zone, you can guarantee it's from him. Remember what I said, when God asks something, it's never easy on the front end. Why? Because it wouldn't require any faith on your part. And here's the second thing. When God asks you to do something, it's going to require that you would be harder on yourself than you would be if it was somebody else asking. The things God asks you to do is going to require more of you than what you would have required of yourself. Some of you here today, God brought because you're in the middle of a dilemma. You're here today because you've been asking that question, what is the right thing for me to do? What, what, how do I know God is speaking to me? God brought you here because he wanted to show you something that when he is speaking, you should be able to recognize his voice from all the other voices. And when you know it's God, he wants you to be obedient then, right then, and not put it off until later. I want you to understand something. When God asks something of us, oftentimes we don't understand why until much farther down the road. What God asked of Mary was embarrassing, it was costly, but it also was something that would never be forgotten. Because just two days later, Jesus would carry the fragrance of her sacrifice with him to the cross. When he was beaten, when he was whipped, when he was sweating drops of blood, right in the midst of that was the fragrance of her sacrifice. Why? Because that anointing that she had poured upon his head was running down his body as he hung on the cross, as he prayed for you, as he prayed for me, as Jesus made his sacrifice, the aroma of her sacrifice stayed with him until he said, Father, it is finished. I've done what you sent me here to do. And I think all along the way, every time the wind shifted and he caught a whiff of that fragrance, he was reminded that nothing's wasted. There's no sacrifice I can make that God is asking me to make that would never be repaid in eternity. So whatever it is that God's speaking to you about, whatever it is he's asking you to do, you can count on this. Nothing's wasted. Nothing's forgotten. And the greatest disappointments that you're ever going to face in life are not going to be the times when you disappointed the people around you or you let somebody else down. It's going to be the times where you look back and you realize that opportunity's come and it's gone and I'll never have a chance to do what God was asking me to do then, those times of regret will be the things we look back on and say, oh, if I could have, I would go back and I would change it. The reality is we can't go back and change any of the mistakes we've made, but we can put ourselves in a position today to be obedient to what God is asking us to do no matter what.